part of the urinary system below the kidney. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, just a refresher, what is terahertz? Terahertz lies between the microwave and the infrared regions of electromagnetic spectrum. So this is a trillion. Yeah? Okay, 0.1 trillion frequency. Okay, and this is what is known as a terahertz frequency. So primarily it's used for telecommunications where they exceed microwave. They are also ideal for detecting substances. Almost every molecule has a fingerprint in the terahertz range. Now, telecommunications make use of microwave. If you have a 5G phone, this microwave. 6G phone is uh, just to help you see in context then you want the whole spectrum from very long wavelength which are radio waves to very short wavelength which are x-rays and gamma rays so visible light is clear from red light to uh, violet and uh, visible light is only this bit longer than infrared will be terahertz between microwave and so wi-fi is there Okay, mobile is there. Now, breakthrough in terahertz technology come in the 1990s where new techniques were developed to generate, monitor and detect terahertz waves. And in 2011, the breakthrough came when terahertz wave was used to identify a painting, look at the painting to uncover. In the past, painting used to be painted over. Huh? And they were able to discover details below the surface painting. They were even able to discover the artist's name, which is hidden below the, uh, the, the painting on the surface. So before this thing happened, nobody knows how to study terahertz and this was called the terahertz gap. Why is there a gap? Right. There was a gap because radio waves were studied under electronics, whereas x-ray, gamma rays, all that were studied under photonics or the study of light. Uh, so what do you use to study terahertz? There was this gap there. Now of course photonics have come over to study this and if you are aware in China there's a lot of search on Photonics. Now, right now, terahertz applications are in telecommunications, as I mentioned just now, 6G is in the military as well as security, where it can image, uh, it can look through plastic, textile, paper, cardboard, it can look through a lot of things. Okay. So, because it can look through a lot of things, it is highly secure. Even traditional uh, scans cannot identify terrorists is able to do so. And in fact, it's so powerful uh, that some people in the U.S. say that it infringes private, uh, infringe privacy. So they, they seek to delay it. Yes and no, even current scanning techniques, you can actually see through a person. You go to immigration, you know that. And they seem to have no problem with that. Then that's, that's to do with security. In agriculture, in China, it's been used for monitoring drought, all this kind of thing. In health and science, uh, we've been using, scientists have been studying terahertz and look at the way it can image uh, different parts of the body, especially tumors. It, it is of very high resolution. It can, for example, pick up the three layers in the bone. So it's very, very so Some people call terahertz the light of life. So the healing properties of terahertz come from two important uh, characteristics of terahertz. One is that it gives heat, and heat can penetrate. It, heat energy can cause cells to push out toxin and stimulate water molecules. And then there's this vibration. The vibration aspect is very important. Because for many many years now, people have been using energy, medicine energy in the form of vibration here, and uh, various frequencies have been identified. So energy medicine has now been very uh, uh, popular nowadays. You can even say that acupuncture, in some way, uh, energy medicine due to vibrate. So in medical usage, two medical usage. One is the or diagnosis where we use machines to image and look through and we can see what's inside very clearly. The other ones is use it for therapy. I will say a little bit more about that later on. But uh, the eye color care that we use is used to help to help us to become normal. So the property as far as therapy is concerned, low, ener low energy so it doesn't ionize. So it doesn't cause your cells to uh, mutate, become abnormal. You can say just now it can penetrate through all these things and is absorbed by polar compounds. So the thing is is if it's a conductor of electricity, it will absorb terahertz. But any non-conductor, wood, plastic, paper, clothing, uh, it can penetrate. And the energy is correspond to what in chemistry we call hydrogen bonds and van der Waal force. These are the same forces that are operating in terahertz water or alkaline water. Terahertz can change the shape of molecules. How it does so? Because it resonates at the brick of cell okay so biological systems can change as a result of terahertz radiation and particularly in the case of certain 
protein molecule like neurotransmitters and receptors. Now the effect on the human body is on blood vessel, on water molecules which become activated and uh, inside the cell there are organelles called mitochondria and this can increase energy production as a result of therapy. And uh, hyperactive cells, inflammatory cells can become normal as a result as the influence of terahertz and uh, on DNA it can actually unzip and activate DNA. So here are some uh, uh, pictures to show you the effect of terahertz. One is open up blood vessels, that's what it does, open up blood vessels. Uh, blood when they come from the heart is under pressure, so water, all the good things, oxygen, nutrients that you eat and digested, leave the capillary. So beyond that, because it's no longer the effect of the heart and the pumping action of the heart, the pressure become lower. And so water and waste products, carbon dioxide, get absorbed into the vein. So because it's no longer under pressure, you find that there's a lot of water, there's a lot of waste products still gathering around. And that's, a, that's why we have this limb vessel, basically drainage vessel, drain away all the waste product, all the excess water, all the carbon dioxide. So open up blood vessels, then it regulate inflammatory response. So in the bloodstream, there are a lot of cells that cause inflammation. They're there to protect us, but sometimes they're hyperactive. When they're hyperactive, then you have diseases caused by excessive inflammation and terrorists is able to regulate them so uh, diseases that cause excessive inflammation like autoimmune diseases, lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis calm down, the, the inflammation get reduced as well of terror. Normal cells, in a normal cell you have this thing called the mitochondria the mitochondria, you can think of the mitochondria as a factory for all kinds of activities in the cell it can for example transport things inside the cell uh, it can metabolize, it can import protein, uh, it can produce energy and when the cell reach the limit of its lifespan it causes the cell self destruct called apoptosis. Okay? So when the cell reach its lifespan, a, a, a human cell lasts about 120 days and beyond that the nucleus began to disintegrate and the cells began to send out protein molecules they basically send out signals, find me and eat me signal. Okay? So when other cells detect these signals, particularly certain white blood cells, they will destroy the cell. And that's how the body gets rid of cells that are too old. This apoptosis in normal cells. Now, when it comes to bacteria, microorganisms, various viruses, parasites and all that, the terahertz wave can stabilize it, that means they can destroy it. It's a very powerful thing and uh, a lot of infections can grow by it. So it activates DNA. This is how it activates DNA. The terahertz is able to open up the DNA so that when the, when the DNA is in a double helix, there's no activity. The DNA is not activated. But when it's open up, it can make RNA which can go to synthesize protein. It can uh, create another DNA strand so that the DNA can be duplicated. So, uh, uh, terahertz is able to do that. So, we're going to talk about the urinary tract. We're going to talk about urinary obstruction, diseases of the bladder, and then prostate and urethra. So, lower urinary tract is ureter downwards all the way here. Okay? And now we talk a little bit about the ureter. Ureter is the tube that connects the kidney to the bladder. And because it's just a tube, fairly simple. The most important thing is that it can get obstructed. It can be obstructed by many things. The calculi, which are basically hit stones form in the kidney. Uh, it can uh, be pressed on by various tumors in the, in, the, in the stomach, in the abdomen, for example, tumors of the uh, stomach, the colon, the liver, the pancreas. When they enlarge, they can press on it. And if you have an operation, operational scars, that means the scars that form after the operation can cause the ureter to be obstructed, blood clots. Red nodes due to cancer and growth in females. Those who, those who have suffered from endometriosis will have a lot of fibrous tissue growth, and this can cause the ureter to be obstructed. Sometimes there's a swelling of the ureter. This, this is only found near the bladder. Okay. Now, although stones, we think of stones as being able to block the ureter, very unusual do we see the ureter being blocked by the by stones. Uh, coming from the kidney. That's because most stones coming down from the kidney are microscopic in nature. Those that are large tend to remain in the kidney and we've got to disrupt those stones in the kidney so that they pass out. So when there's obstruction, what happens? There's a lot of pain. Changes in the urine output find difficulty in urination. So if one 
ureter is completely blocked your urine comes only from the other kidney and usually because if it's blocked there's usually some injury to the ureter cells and there will be blood in the urine infection and if the ureter is blocked it impacts on the kidney and as you as i've said in my previous talk it will cause the kidney to have high blood because uh, kidney also control blood so this is what ureteric obstruction looks like for whatever cause remove the obstruction and put it back now notice that the uh, ureter come here and at this point you have the arteries here and it sits on the edge of the pelvic bone huh? the pelvic bone is a circle right circle so here it sits on the pelvic bone and this is where it can press so in the female when they are pregnant the, the, the fetus the baby inside the womb can press on this one and press the, everything against the pelvic bone and that's where it comes so a urethrocele is a sac liquid within the ureter as it enters the bladder so from the bladder side of course this is harmless so all you need to do is to remove it and everything will be okay mm -hmm. yes we know oh so this is for people with this condition right oh this oh. is to show you how the condition looks like i see if, okay. if the doctor were to insert a tube uh, uh, they, 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 they can take a picture of what's inside uh, then they can remove it so that it doesn't create the pressure on it much. Okay. Right. because this thing can collect urine and if it collects urine you press on it and the collection of urine can cause you and other problems. So yeah, these are ways of dealing with urine. So bladder, most important is in fact. And uh, two other conditions are incontinence and overactive bladder, which we will discuss. Interstitial cystitis is a kind of inflammation not due to infection. Huh? So there are many causes of this. Huh? So I will not discuss it. a whole range of proof. You must be aware that sometimes your inflammation of your bladder is not due to infection, due to other uh, can be due to a, a, a catheter, can be all kinds of things like that you may put into the bladder because whatever thing. So and there's of course bladder cystitis, infection of the bladder and the lower urinary tract often leads to a bladder. It's commonly in female. Male have a three percent prevalence in the female. At least twenty percent of females would have a urinary tract infection. In fact, a lot of times. 80% of urinary tract infection in the female are recurrent because again, uh, commonest is E. coli. That tells you E. coli is a bacteria commonly found in feces. So if the infection is by E. coli, it means that somehow material from the feces enter into the bladder. And I will show you why it happens. Then another commonest cause of urinary tract infection is sexually transmitted diseases, especially gonorrhea and chlamydia. Of course, if you have diabetes, if you have immobile, you have an indwelling catheter, or your kidney stones, it makes it worse. Lah. So, urinary tract infection can be asymptomatic. In other words, you can have the infection without knowing it. So this happens all the time. For example, a, a, a female or male can be infected without showing any symptoms like through sexual intercourse, pass on to the other partner, and then the other partner uh, get it, and then they each can blame one another because it can be easy. And you can imagine the kind of curious thing. And uh, sometimes when you investigate, you realize that it may have occurred to uh, another sort. During pregnancy, infections are more common because of the pressure of the fetus. Okay? Now, this diagram helps you to show you why it is more common in a female. Look at the urethra in the female. It's very short and it's directly uh, a kind of face to the exterior. So from the exterior to the interior of the bladder, is a very short thing. In the male, the urethra is very long. So that's why it's less likely to have infection. The thing you notice is that the sexual organs are separated from the urethra. Okay? The uterus is here, the vagina is here, and this is the urethra. In the male, sperm is carried from the statis to what is known as a vas deferens. And look at the journey of the vas deferens. It go up, go round, come back, and join the urethra here in the prostate. Because of the long distance and because it joined the urethra again, the, the, the sexual part, the sexual organ of the male and the urethra are together and that's a very important difference okay? and that accounts for all the kind of differences you see between the male and the female okay so one of the symptoms of urinary tract infection very simply pain during urination and there is a urge to urinate called frequency you go to pass your urine many times huh? inability to start urinating they cannot initiate they feel the urge they feel the need to pass but nothing comes up or the urine stream is very slow or there's leakage and 
Sometimes there's a need to urinate and nothing comes out. Blood in urine sometimes is seen in urinary tract infection and there's usually a lower abdominal pain. So the urine is usually cloudy, there's a smell and if it's spread to the rest of the body, if the infection spread with the fever, chills, nausea, vomiting and of course back pain. So what do you do for urinary tract infection? You find that you can do a urine analysis and you will find during urine analysis there will be where the cells are seen, okay? And bacteria can be identified if you uh, send for microscopy. You can culture to identify the organism responsible. So uh, you take the urine centrifuge, get the bacteria and culture it. Then you can image, do a scan to detect any abnormalities in the bladder that may contribute to the infection. And the treatment for urinary infection is of course antibiotic. So recurrent infection, infections that occur frequently, as in a female, you may need long-term low-dose antibiotic. And in menopausal females, you may need to do some hormonal therapy in order to get it back on back to normal. And of course, you need medication to relieve pain and you need lots of fluids uh, in order to drain out all the uh, excess uh, pus and all that. So these are some pictures of urinary tract infection. So pyronephritis we see last time is associated with kidney infection, ureter, bladder, urethra, urethritis. Uh. So the symptoms of urinary tract infection being painful or burning urination, constant urge, bloody urine, foul odor and women tell with pain. So how do you prevent? I think because uh, uh, genitals are involved, cleanse your genitals before and after sex, urinate immediately, wash your rectum. That's very important to the females. Uh, after you uh, defecate, it should be wiped backward okay? so that uh, any contamination from the rectum is pushed to the rear instead of wiping forward where the contamination of the rectum can be passed to the uh, urethra. Bring lots of water and don't hold your urine. Urinary incontinence. Urinary incontinence refer to urine leaking by accident and it's particularly worse with age. The older you are, the more likely you get incontinence. And in the females, multiple pregnancy can lead to this kind of multiple pregnancy cause the muscles of the pelvis to be weakened. It's when you have a leaky urine, it's not only aggravated by age, but any movement that causes pressure in the abdomen, such as coughing, sneezing, laughing, lifting heavy objects, will lead to le leaking. And uh, so as a result, this leaky urine is very embarrassing and it often leads to restriction of activities and a negative quality of life. People with such problems usually are very shy about going out because they need to go to the toilet ever so often. And the important thing is to find out whether there's an infection or not, whether there are contributing causes. Sometimes it can point to other conditions that will be present and uh, the urologist often will look at how the urine and the uh, flow is. So you may need to study how the urine flow is the, from the kidney downwards so they understand how it flows. So in overactive bladder, is involuntary muscle contraction. It can lead to incontinence of urine. Uh, you find that there is, you, you pass out water many times, both in the day and night. You know, it's associated with alcohol, caffeine, and any medication that induces urination. And it's associated with conditions in the nervous system as well as that. The key feature of overactive bladder is a sudden urge to urinate and unable to control the urination. Well, how do you manage incontinence? First thing is medical treatment. You must know what are the aggravating factors, whether it is, whether any neurological condition, and look at the diet and drinking behavior, anything that stimulates the bladder, alcohol, coffee, and so forth, and avoid those drinks that induce urination. As I mentioned, coffee, alcohol similar. Then you need behavioral management and I shall talk about this later. Nerve stimulation treatment, uh, we would, nerve, nerve stimulation is to stimulate the nerve so that the uh, urination will be more normal and for sometimes surgery can be indicated. So behavioral management, you restrict food and drinks that cause diuresis and it's recommended that you keep bladder diary. Double voiding is often useful. Double voiding means uh, after you void, you wait for a few minutes and void again. This ensures that any urine that is left in the bladder after you void it can be voided completely. Time urination, it is recommended to people with incontinence and so forth every two or three hours to go to the toilet. This helps to prevent dribbling as a result of overflow. Kegel exercises. Kegel exercises 
uh, exercises of the pelvic, so which women who are pregnant uh, during pregnancy, they learn this kind of But this Kegel exercises can strengthen the pelvic muscle that can control urinary incontinence. Okay, and of course use of biofeedback. Both infrared waves have been used, both near infrared and far infrared. And of course, our terahertz is uh, far infrared. So therefore, terahertz can be used for incontinence and can help us to get control and, and get the muscles of the pelvis as well as the bladder to regain the control once again. So that's behavioral management of incontinence for you. Ah, so these are the types of incontinence. Stress incontinence due to abdominal pressure. This is in a female. When there is pregnancy, there is a lot of pressure and you're stressed. This urgency incontinence is as a result of infection or as a result of stones or whatever. You feel the urgent need to empty your uh, urine. Mix a combination of the two. Overflow incontinence is when the bladder don't completely act. So you can get incontinence as a result dribbling as a result of there's always water inside. This is about overactive bladder. So in overactive bladder, before even the bladder is filled up, it will contract and it will then pass out. So bladder dysfunction, uh, you feel the need to pass out all the time uh, and very hard to initiate. That's what hesitancy means. Difficult to initiate and you dribble urine. And then you can be very urgent and you go to the toilet many times, you can be incontinent, wet your, your, your panties or underwear quickly. So these are all the result of urinary incontinent. Bladder cancer is the 10 most common cancer worldwide. Fifth most common in women, men, fifth most common women, 70% most common cancer. In other words, there's more often in men than in women. They affect older folks, 90% of Bladder cancer are over 55. Average age of bladder cancer patients 73 years old. Most important risk smoking. This is the number one cause of bladder cancer. Workplace chemicals. You are exposed to toxic chemicals in the workplace. You are also likely to get five year survival rate. If it's just local spread bladder cancer, your, your five year survival is 71%. Overall average is about 55%. So very good outcome generally speaking. Okay, And because it's a surface cancer, the bladder is very easy to visualize. When the urologist puts something into the bladder to look inside the bladder, you can see the cancer straight away. So it's normally detected very early. And the earlier signs is blood and urine, frequent urine, difficulty in initiating, dribbling, burning sensation when urinating. So this is a cancer that is easily detected and normally detected early and therefore have good outcome. Okay, so let's move on. These are the symptoms. The blood may be microscopic so you can't see it and when you have urinary symptoms and you examine under the microscope you see the red blood cells in the neck or it can be gross hematuria so that means frank blood coming out and you go to the toilet many times you have the urge to pass but no urine that's what hesitancy is nocturia that means frequent urination at night lower back pain these are all the symptoms of uh, bladder cancer and when you look at the urine there are plenty of red blood cells and you also see cancer cells in the urine itself. So sometimes if the cancer has spread, you find that maybe pain in your bones, you may have abdominal pain and you may have jaundice. That means the, the cancer has spread to the liver. So treatment is by surgery or by the use of radiation. The radiation can be from external or you can actually put a radioactive pellets in the bladder and within it. Chemotherapy is same thing. It can be systemic, that means from outside, or you can introduce the, the chemotherapy drug inside the bladder, intravesical. And then there's targeted immunotherapy, that means you use certain immune cells to attack the cancer. Okay? And this is one of the latest advances in cancer therapy, where the treatment is targeted as a specific protein enzyme that are involved in, yes. in the cancer growth, in the growth of cancer cells. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. And of course, terahertz waves can modify cancer gene expression. Uh, that's why terahertz wave is useful. Uh, can support whatever treatment you're getting by using terahertz wave. Okay, so stages. Uh, this is what bladder cancer looks like. It's in here, inside. And if it's very localized, it's the best. Or it's spread to other tissue, stage 2. And then it's spread to other parts. Uh, then this is not. So, advanced bladder cancer, urination problems, pain, weight loss, a lot of anxiety, feeling very weak. Of fatigue, bone pain, swollen feet because of the pressure. Disease of the prostate, the three main things infection, 
benign prostate, benign prostatic hypoplasia or BPH and prostate cancer. So prostatitis and urethritis usually occurs together because the prostate is part of the uh, tube coming down from the bladder. So catheter, biopsy or sexually transplant. In older men, chronic prostatitis can occur as a result of previous prostatitis and urethritis are totally unrelated. The symptoms include frequency of urination to urgent night urine, painful urine, pain in the genital area, abdominal and back pain, fever chills. These are the usual symptoms that occur in the lower urine tract. And Prostatitis is always associated with urinary tract infection, particularly urethritis, and they're often treated together. Urethritis can lead to strictures, cause blockades, and uh, it's very painful. And the only way to, to treat urethritis where there are strictures, strictures is to open up by forcing it open so that it becomes pain. In the past, this is seen quite often because of gonorrhea. Gonorrhea caused these strictures. Benign prostate hypoplasia or BPH is a non-malignant growth of tissue enlarging with age. For males, if you live long enough, you will always get BPH. <laughs> it's a fact of life. So at 50 years old, 50% of men get it. By 80 years old, 90% of men and those that they don't have symptoms, have, their prostate have shrunk due to treatment or uh, is associated with present of testosterone. How do we know? Men who are castrated uh, and so testosterone is no longer present in their uh, uh, blood. They don't get prostate enlargement. Diabetes, obesity, heart and circulatory disease aggravate. And that's very interesting. Uh, if you have heart disease, chances are you will have some problem. So the prostate can lead to blockage the urethra urine retention, dribbling. Symptoms of prostate enlargement, frequency. You urinate very often. The urgency, you cannot delay. And there are very, very great difficulties starting a, a, a urinary stream. And if you go to a male toilet, you find that a lot of old men just stand at a urinal for a long time <laughs> to urinate and that's because of the difficulty initiate. Very weak interrupted stream, dribbling incontinent, night time, urination, urine retention. Now this is very important in the good old days when we don't know much about uh, prostate enlargement and uh, as person began to improve the lifespan of people and because they live longer as we say just now, if you live long enough a male will get prostate enlargement. You find a lot of males coming in with urinary retention. They can't pass water for more than 24 hours. That means they tried to pass but they couldn't pass. Unable and trouble initiating urine. So they'll come to a uh, hospital and the history is typically at least one day, sometimes two days without urine. And when your abdomen is enlarged and the bladder is very huge. And uh, in those days I was working as a houseman and so when these people come in, all we need to do is to pass a catheter inside and drain the thing be your maze. One liter, two liters, not uncommon. Sometimes three. There's so much urine. So nowadays, of course, when you have difficulty urination, you go and see a doctor and find out that yes, your prostate is enlarged. And other things they also affect pain after urination. So when you have when the urethra when it's blocked in the prostate, your bladder walls also get overworked and sometimes they get weakened also. So block urethra, urinary retention, blood in urine, urine infection. Yes, so if the urine is collected, then of course a collection of water always leads to infection on it. Uh, and bladder and kidney damage. And if your urine is concentrated, of course, it produces stones. So that's where the prostate is, just below the bladder. And as you can see here, the urethra pass through the prostate. Now, when the prostate is enlarged, it narrows this. That's where uh, uh, urinary retention takes place. Okay? And if you put in a thing to take a look, it looks like it should be an open hole, but you know, the two sides just come together and block. So that's why they have difficulty and all that. Obesity and type 2 diabetes. So it's generally that's true. Come to think of it, there are a lot of the patients that catheterize, collect so much urine, they tend to be on site. So you can diagnose by putting a finger inside there, you can feel the prostate or by doing an ultrasound scan. Nowadays there are very good ultrasound actually uh, scan the entire prostate to see how big. So how do you handle a large prostate? Very simple. There's a lot of medication used, a lot of life science change that you can do and now a lot of procedures are done by putting a cystoscope through the urethra. Now, last time it was above from the abdomen so you've got to cut through the bladder wall and then you've got to stitch up the bladder wall but now they can go through the urethra and so it's minimally invasive and what can you do? 
You can remove prostate, prostate tissue by using ultrasound, heat, water, vapors, laser. So you put the tube inside at, at the uh, level of the urethra, you, at, the, at the level of the prostate, you can do all these things. Camera hurt support or device actually support uh, the treatment of post surgery. That's what it means. The tube is injected through the urethra and then deal with it. Huh? This is an older technique. The penis is here. This is the pelvis. You see that the prostate is behind the pelvis. So it comes in from the abdomen. This is an old technique. And then you can uh, remove the or, or shrink the, ure the, the, the prostate gland. Now this what happen when we use various techniques, lasers, uh, water vapor, hot water vapor. So, this is a tube that insert the urethra and you see this thing coming out so you can spray laser, uh, ultrasound, whatever to destroy the prostate tissue and shrink the prostate so this one side is the other side amazing that we can do this nowadays ah, there are several fruits that aggravate prostate your, your prostate will be worse if you consume things like eggs, honey, red meat, alcohol, sugar drinks hydrogenates like margarine, trans fats, spicy food and foods that help you to have a normal prostate, mainly fruits, vegetables, cruciferous vegetables are those with a cross when you cut through the stem, broccoli, kailan, things like that, garlic, onion, these, these are all foods that are antioxidant and protect you against cancer as well. Coffee protects against prostate manually, interesting, so does green tea, nut, uh, avocados, uh, a urologist I put this lemon rind there. A urologist discovered that uh, the, the skin of the lemon, uh, he kind of used a, what do you call that? One of those uh, things that... Uh, blender. Uh, blender. A uh, blender. Mm. He blended lemon rind and other fruits together and it seems that it's quite powerful at uh, causing the prostate to regret, come back to normal size. I haven't tried it myself, <laughs> but it should be quite interesting. Huh? So lifestyle changes for prostate and large prostate, what can be done? Cis bars. Cis bars are a very shallow basin. Uh, hip gains a, a back feel with warm water and basically you kind of uh, soak bottom of your buttock uh, in this shallow basin and it seems to improve. Huh? Consume fruits, vegetables, maintain a healthy weight because prostate enlargement associated with obesity. Regular exercises and keep fit. Pelvic floor exercises, Kegel exercises. As I said just now, these are exercises females do during pregnancy, right? Mm. To strengthen the pelvic muscles. And in elderly females also, you need to do this kind of exercises because of the incontinence. So in a male with prostate problem, this kind of exercise. Avoid cycling. Okay. It's been found that cycling, especially if you cycle long distance, affect the prostate gland by causing perhaps damage or harm. Yeah. And uh, the prostate specific antigen PSA, a substance in the, the prostate secrete when it's damaged, is high. So that, uh, then this technique for coping with incontinence, urinary incontinence, whatever the cause, you really need a fixed interval and double voiding. Fixed interval means every two to three hours. Double voiding means after you void, you wait for a few minutes and void again. So any excess water urine in the bladder removed and uh, this coffee while well, it helps you not to have a prostate when you have a prostate coffee and alcohol because it irritates the bladder make things worse so uh, zinc supplement according to uh, search so a very important consideration for, for men is erectile dysfunction and what we know is that enlarged prostate can aggravate erectile dysfunction conversely erectile dysfunction can lead to prostate enlargement worsening enlarged prostate can lead to reduced sex drive and treatment for enlarged prostate can lead to erectile dysfunction. Cialis, which is a, uh, a drug for treating erectile dysfunction, have this activity that it can improve both prostate enlargement as well as erectile dysfunction. And uh, medications for erectile dysfunction can be safely used prostate. And both share common aggravating factors like diabetes and heart. So people with heart disease will get this problem, see. In fact, you can safely predict that if a person has high blood pressure, that he will have erectile dysfunction and prostate. Almost definite, I would say. But the good news is that our terahertz laser have a positive effect on both prostate enlargement as well as erectile dysfunction. And that's the good news, I think. And why we should use this? Uh, okay. 
Let me show you one slide. Uh, in case you have people, uh, you know that prostate is here, right? This is the bladder, isn't it? Now, if you blow in this area, it may or may not hit, yeah? but there will be urine here, right? So when you blow your thing at water, what happens? The water becomes charged, isn't it? So if the urine becomes charged, it will also affect. So I, I reason myself, uh, you know, as, as a uh, scientific person. Where, where, because surgeons use this route to reach the prostate. So you can actually, in the instruction manual, you are told to blow here, okay? Blow here, okay? Uh, but if you look carefully at this thing, it go into the prostate here, right? So if I blow here, mm -hmm. I blow here. In other words, below from the side, because erectile dysfunction, prostate and large uh, share a lot of common factors, this thing also works. And also from on top. Down. So I figured that out, uh, that these three, these are the areas, because it is so small. The size of the walls, have you seen a walnut, uh, supermarket, you know, that's the size of the normal process. So it's very inaccessible. So I thought these are alternative routes. This is uh, very useful. And this is a route that you can use for prostate such. In the good old days, people do prostatic massage through the rectum. That is intra, uh, internal prostate massage. Internal is through on the skin here. So these are ways whereby we can help people with prostate enlargement to be relieved. Uh, that is a question I, I'm glad I, you asked and we can talk about it. Yeah. Okay, right here, right? Okay. Uh, prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is the second most commonly diagnosed cancer in here. It's very common, but the good news is a slow-growing cancer and it's curable with early diagnosis. And in the US, it's the second leading cause of death. Survive very well. 95% survive after five years. The risk for prostate cancer age, obesity, and family history, as well as exposure to certain chemicals, okay? Now, there is a common belief, and it appears to be supported by some studies that show that the frequency of ejaculation in men will reduce prostate. That is to say that if men uh, regularly have sex or masturbate, then prostate cancer chances will reduce. Well, there may be some truth to that. Cycling and prostate cancer, no correlation. This time, there's no such correlation. Uh, this is on the Singapore cancer right? in Singapore is the second most common cancer diagnosed and cause of that in males you find prostate cancer isn't that so in other words those who are diagnosed with prostate cancer don't die of prostate that's the good news you can live long recently uh, you may or may have not seen those who have read the local newspaper there was a uh, prostate specialist, right? A urologist who was diagnosed to have prostate mm -hmm. local doctor in one of the hospitals. So he was shocked by it and because he himself is specialized in prostate cancer as well. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. So he said, well, the chances of me surviving is 50 because it's, the survival rate is very But he also realized that as a patient, how difficult it is to get good support and advice from his colleague. So when a doctor becomes a patient, then they realize yeah. how, how, how tough life So diagnosis, all the usual symptoms, difficulty, Excuse urination, me. interrupted flow, painful urination, blood in the urine, uh, painful mm -hmm. ejaculation. Mm -hmm. The best way is to confirm uh, uh, the best way to confirm the diagnosis is by doing a biopsy uh, and there are two ways to do the biopsy. Complication, when a stone gets this, this stuff out of it, uh, there's this PSA. PSA antigen is secreted by the prostate. Normal PSAs are less than one nanogram milk, but it tends to rise and we look for a steep increase. But PSA is not diagnostic because you can have a low PSA and still have prostate cancer. Conversely, you can have a high PSA and still not be cancer. So it's not non-specific. And so that's why we look for sleep. The PSA increase very sharply. Usually, that's an indication. And uh, well, we confirm it by doing a scan, MRI, CT or PET scan to determine how much it spread. Of course, isotope bone scan with this bone pain indicating that the cancer has spread. So how do you deal with it? Surgery, radiation treatment, cryo, cryo, cryo is uh, ice. Uh, uh, you inject, I think it's liquid nitrogen, which solidify as a solid and it's ice cold. Lower temperature than ice. So we use chemotherapy, immunotherapy and hormone therapy. Ah, and in prostate cancer, we can use high intensity focus on. It just tells you something. Terahertz help what you need. Because terahertz is active against cancer cells, cause uh, reduce the expression of <laughs> cancer cells and more importantly, terahertz help cells. So, biopsy is two roots, one through the rectum, transrectal, one from the perineal. So, can Start this way and you spread the bladder to the surrounding. So, here we talk about many conditions like incontinence, like prostate, like uh, bladder problems where terrorists is supposed to help. So, 
I want to say a bit about laser. A laser beam in medical practice is a beam of intense light. It must be number one, the same wavelength. You can have all a few wavelengths all mixed together. And secondly, their peaks must face. In other words, all the wavelengths, all the waves, all their peaks must be at the same time and then goes down. You know the wave, isn't it? You buy a fridge, they tell you inverse wave. Inverse wave, that means when it goes up and down, when it's up, they leave it up. When it's down, they invert that down to the top so that you have consistent energy. You get the energy of the down phase added. So by combining the light in such a way that the peaks are same, you have more focused energy. And you can use, in medicine at least, the frequency we use range from ultraviolet right through infrared. And even microwave has uh, treating all kinds of conditions. And of course, uh, the, the most important thing about this laser is that in the treatment of stones, kidney stones, stones anywhere in the body, in the gallbladder, uh, infrared lasers have been used. Okay? Now, once laser have absorbed, uh, it leads to decay, the, the, the decay of stones, tissues and all that. And the heat generated can lead to chemical decomposition, therefore melts down and it destroys tissue. The effectiveness depends on the power of it. So this is what we call medical lasers. Medical lasers, intense light, one frequency, all the peaks in phase and it must have enough power. Okay? Now this is terribly important. Your frequency can range all the way from ultraviolet to infrared and in microwave, radio waves now. This is medical grade. This is not medical. So you can produce waves, but it's of this kind. It's a spread. It doesn't have the effect of medical. Our uh, uh, terahertz wave is more like because if it's medical, if it's medical laser, it's very focused, very intense. It will have to be regulated. The fact is for home use, tell you that. Now this is terribly important. I hear that in some countries, people set up clinics, treatment centers, and use this trick. I think it's not right. Yeah. Conversely, uh, somebody from the US wrote to me to ask me some point, say that nobody wants to tell what to do because they're afraid of being sued. Uh, US, everybody sue everybody else. Yeah. So this is the issue with regard to eye care, care. That because it is not medical grade, there are some things we can say and some things we cannot, it cannot cure. Yeah. And I wouldn't say that, you know, if you have heart disease or anything, just use this and go see a doctor. I wouldn't say mm -hmm. you need a doctor proper diagnosis. And in fact, in some of the testimonies I read, they couldn't recover. They have to see a doctor. Why I know? Because I treated the condition before. <laughs> you can't recover without doing other things. See? So there is a lot of promise for terror. It can do a lot to improve your health. And that's what it's all about. It's a matter of balance. Healthy lifestyle choices. As you can see, for a lot of things, a healthy diet, fruits, vegetables, uh, uh, things like that, uh, fruits with antioxidants, help you to have a healthy function, even though you have a risk for so a happy, healthy mind, good healthy habits of nutrition, exercise, obesity, cause a lot of problems. In fact, uh, it has been demonstrated, this, this study was a WHO study over many years, 10 years I believe, and they look at it systematically, and they found that obesity contributes to all kinds of cancer. So no advantage where everybody die from infections and die from all kinds of things and people die young by the age of 50 plus they die off. Then maybe a little bit of obesity is helpful to give you that extra boost uh, from nutrients that are stored in your fat cell. But nowadays medical living longer, obesity is no longer an option. So take care of yourself. Nutrition, exercise is incredibly important. Adopt a positive outlook, take steps to lower your stress. Take time to connect with your loved ones and yourself. This helps us, you know. Uh, it has been shown that when I connect with more people, it support my body's immune. Somehow or other, it helps be connected with have a happy, healthy life. Be serious, but make sure you have lots of fun and laughter as well. And you steroids, bear and regenerate. Make you look feel young. So suitable for all kinds of things. Huh? Skin, uh, especially skin blockages, various pains. Not suitable if you're pregnant, disease. Open wound. This is a big question here. I've seen several articles written uh, of late that showed that in open wounds, terahertz it will promote wound healing so that is contrary to what the accepted wisdom huh? but then that's where we learn you know, open wounds well this is a scan that i use to help detect abnormal uh, body function okay so we scan and when we scan it will scan show you what is abnormal so it's very useful to know uh, which part of the body is to scan in case you're not sure? This for the, all the organs, is it? All, all the organs, oh. your entire body. And if you like what I give, support me by buying my books or sign up for some of the things I have. My mobile number is there and my email is there.